All righty. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to our Tim Talk. Today, we're going to be talking about building systems and organizations that support racial equity. Um, my name is Brenda Jimenez. I'm CEO of Mentor New York, and it gives me great pleasure to invite back two of my favorite friends, Dr. Rolana Ward and Chasani West, to speak to us a little bit about where we are today. Um, it's hard to believe it's been almost a year that the two of us, the three of us got together to have a similar conversation right um, after the murder of George Floyd and sort of the racial unrest and the racial reckoning that starts to occur in this country. And the conversation that we um, decided to have to help mentoring programs and youth development leaders start to explore how they start to have these conversations with young people and their families but more importantly, how do they start to create anti-racist systems within their own programs and organizations as they're doing this work, right? Um, we know this is a, an iterative process. And so since we've been last together, we're sort of in the genesis of um, the Derek Chauvin trial, um, the genesis of COVID-19 vaccination rollout, and the impact that this global pandemic has had in lifting the racial inequities that exist in our country and what we have to do to be better at community and supporting one another. Um, we've had an election with a change of administration. We've had an insurrection um, in the midst of this, all sort of still under this umbrella of that racial tension that exists, right? We have a new female vice president of black and Asian descent. Um, and we have the reality that there is still very much a racial divide in this country that has manifested itself, not only socially, economically, um, from a health disparity perspective, but also now is being re-illuminated in the political sort of schism that we have. And then it has crescendoed into this um, law in Georgia and over 46 states that are looking at restricting, right, voter rights across this country. And this interesting reality that has occurred around, we no longer can be performative in our stance for diversity, equity, and inclusion. We actually have to show up. And so corporate CEOs, I think, have taken an initial very transparent step to say, we've got to go beyond the performance and beyond the hiring right, the bean counting of people to look like we have diversity and stand up for something. And they are publicly saying, hey, Georgia, this is not the way to go. Um, there is consequences to the citizenry across the board. And so the MLB has decided not to have their all-star game in Atlanta and other companies have followed suit around taking a really strong stance against something. And so I think that we're moving into this non-performative moment and into this moment that we have to now dig in and do the, the, the work, right? And we talk a lot the, about this. And so today I wanna go beyond the work that you have to do with yourself, which is continual and something that Dr. Ward and Chitani advised us the last time to really educate yourself, to be part of the fiber of becoming anti-racist from the inside out and talk about what is it that we need to do in our systems, in our programs, with our young people in order to move this beyond just a self-education and a performative act into a systemic change that really can be equitable for all young people that step into the room when they're with us. And so I wanna take this opportunity to have Dr. Ward introduce herself first and then Chastani will follow and introduce herself. And then I'm gonna open it up to the questions that I have for you moving into how do we do these systemic changes. Thank you, Ms. Brenda. It's a pleasure to be here today. I'm super excited to join you. So everyone, my name is Rolanda Ward and I am Associate Professor of Social Work at Niagara University. I am also the Endowed Faculty Director for the Rose Bentley Ostapenko Center for Race, Equity, and Mission. 
Um, I am coming to you um, serving as uh, the project director for one of our high school programs up here in Niagara Falls, New York. And hopefully we'll get to talk about those young people a little bit today. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon. Thank you, Brenda, for that warm introduction. Thank you, Dr. Ward. I'm Chasani Williams-West from Adelphi University. I serve as the executive director of the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Office. Um, and my work really um, is student-facing. I look at the student-facing initiatives um, to make sure that their voices are heard in um, DEI and anti-racism work. And um, my focus, my research happens to be on how mentoring really impacts the collegiate experience of BIPOC students. And so, um, you know, in my answers and our conversation today, I'll be able to make those linkages and I'm happy to be here with you today. Thank you both for being here. So I'm gonna kick it off. I'm gonna ask you, Dr. Ward, um, you know, it's it's been several months. You've been doing a lot of work. What are some of the significant systemic changes that you've been able to make in your organization and in the organizations you're working with? Because you really are a community leader in different, you know, um, sectors across the Niagara region. Um, so tell me a little bit about, you know, the systems and the changes that you've made to uh, to be in organizations that are more anti-racist and um, have more measurable practices of change. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm gonna I'm gonna hit on three things really quickly. Um, the first thing is here at the university. So um, one of the things that we've done is we've done a lot of introspection around how is it that we serve um, our students, our faculty, staff as well as our alumni through um, a racial equity lens. And so that has required us to examine some of our current practices and programs and looked at the data, followed the data to see where we needed to invest more resources, our time and our energy in order to have better outcomes. And so our university has taken on this task um, uh, with a supercharge and um, we are providing updates to our community every two weeks about the progress that we've made regarding our um, task force report that was generated last summer. And so, you know, just to kind of touch on two, two of the things that we've done, we've created new scholarships um, for BIPOC students. Um, so they may fall outside of our traditional financial aid needs, right? And so that will meet the needs of some students um, who might not have actually tapped into um, uh, some of the traditional um, avenues of finances. We have begun to train sectors and departments um, by bringing in some local leaders in racial equity and having those departments go through trainings. We have ongoing trainings here on our campus um, led by our faculty and staff. Um, so the conversations are, are um, thoroughly being had on our campus. Um, and we're also looking to ask departments to do something strategic over the summer. So um, we will be having a campus meeting in a couple of weeks um, where that conversation will begin. So that's campus. Now in the community, our high school students, we have um, expanded what REACH is. So we're starting to look at what are some of the disciplines that need additional BIPOC representation. Um, and we're targeting, um, we're creating tracks for students now um, so that they can get college credits, but move towards their goal when they hit college. And two uh, disciplines that we're trying to impact are education. We need more teachers of color um, in our district and in our region. And we also need more nurses. Um, so our, you know, when you go into the hospitals, you don't see many brown faces. And then finally, the last thing that I'll talk about is that we're trying to increase access to the vaccine um, here in Western New York and specifically in Niagara County. And the numbers are pretty low when it comes to um, our brown and black people being vaccinated. And so how do we get into our neighborhoods and increase access to education um, and access to choices so that people will become vaccinated. So, you know, I, I think when we talk systems, we have to talk, we have to talk about are we doing the same thing or are we creating new ways for people to access the resources that they need in order to become their best self? 
Yeah, thanks. And I, what I'm hearing you say is like, you're looking at what are the root causes of why that representation is not occurring and then how do we provide the access? And it does take for you to roll your sleeve and say, why isn't there a Walgreens within 10 blocks of the neighborhood that needs the vaccination, right? And then doing something about it and understanding that you have power to do that. So I really appreciate it. How about Chatani? you know, what's going on on your sort of your spectrum around systems change and in taking that deeper dive? Um, so for me, I'll, I'll pick up where Dr. Ward left off in terms of visibility and representation. We knew that it had to move beyond that, right? And we knew that um, as Dr. Ward has identified that it was a much bigger conversation. So once our students get onto campus and our faculty and staff are together as a community, what is it that we need to do to support their process and their experience? And so um, in addition to zeroing in on you know, an academic implementation team that looks at curricula and how we are um, deconstructing the syllabi, what scholarship is being represented on campus from our own scholars and external scholars, right? Who are we introducing our students to? And then one of the things that I think colleges are responsible for across the planet are asking why and so encouraging our students to ask the why and we have really uh, i'm very proud of the fact that we have allowed our students to lead us and we've included them in the conversation and so structurally um, there's a a process by which the students can actually make recommendations to what's actually being presented in the classroom and those students really um, are not just eating, breathing, and sleeping DEI work, these are students who are also willing to learn and bring their discipline to the conversation. So it doesn't mean that they're only um, majoring in you know, Africana studies or only focusing on um, you know, Latinx studies. The idea is that they're bringing their interest from their discipline. So when we think about healthcare, we have the College of Nursing and Public Health has a um, diversity council that includes students and they look at the disparities that exist in hospital systems, right? And so the conversations that people of color will bring to the hospital can be heard by someone who understands them. We're looking at, you know, how to, you know, better equip our prospective nurses with the ability to translate and what that means to be an advocate even if you're doing an internship, what does that mean if you are observing an interaction that doesn't hear the voice of a patient who does not speak English, right? So, so including our students in these conversations allows us to have it threaded through the fabric of the university um, so that it's that shared collective responsibility. And then we go back. We talk about it and then we go back to hold ourselves accountable. Um, and that's what I'd love to highlight in terms of how um, we are moving the work forward in the different sectors of the university. It, it's just that our students have been really instrumental in how we, we do this work in a holistic way um, from a strengths-based perspective, you know, in my opinion. Yeah, yeah, and so what I'm hearing both of you say is, you know, as a leader, one of the first things, and we talked about this the last time, was the self-work and the data collection, right, to understand what the picture looked like, and we've had time to do that, so now as a leader, you've got to take action, you've got to then use the data to start to inform what the gaps are, and then take definitive action, and then bring people along with you. This is not a, you know, I don't think it's easy to train everyone and get everybody singing Kumbaya. There's resistance in that process. I'm almost certain of it, but you've got to move people and then keep moving. That can't be the deterrent to not keep moving. Maybe that's not the right place for them, even if they've been with you 15 years, it's time to do something else, right? And so I think that that's a really important piece of this. And then Chitani and, and, and Dr. Ward, you, you articulate this well, it's around the youth voice, right? How do you incorporate 
the young people that are around you to create those spaces of equity. They will identify for you what's missing. How do you equip them to be better than we've been in the last few iterations of this process, right? So that we can change what's happening. So those are sort of key things that I, I, I hear you say, you know, do the self work, get the data, act on the data, move people with you and get young people engaged in that process if you want it to work. So as we're talking about this, I guess my question, Chitani, is um, what other things have you seen? You're in this education system, but you're interfacing with a lot of partners. What other things have you seen other organizations do whether it's with young people or their staff or their employees that you go, that's a real game changer right there. Um, I think the biggest piece that, that stands out to me is the conversation to recognize that the world is pushing in on our academic institutions. And so the partnerships that we have, um, you know, we have an external diversity certificate program. And so there's a realization that's happening with our partners that says, you know, before we can get on with the business of the day, we've got to acknowledge what's happening in the world because we are seeing our staff and our community members come in um, feeling the weight of, of what's happening in the world. There are family members who are, you know, trying to figure out how to have conversations around the election, post-election, insurrection. And so where, where, you know, we once were able to kind of focus in on business as usual, I think that our partners are really looking um, collectively internally about what their institution stands for, what their values are, and they're moving beyond um, a statement. Right, Dr. Ward raised this, I think, during our last conversation, that in addition to your anti-racism practices statement, what are you doing to really take care of the folks who you're sitting across the boardroom table with? Are you asking them how they're doing? Are you doing regular wellness checks? And these are things that I think, um, you know, fortunately, COVID has forced us to do. Um, where we're asking those questions because we didn't have a choice. And so I'm really hoping that one of the lingering impacts and the effects of this experience is that our partners will continue to check in on each other um, on that human connection piece. Um, and so that is what I'm starting to see a lot of, and I'm very pleased to see it. So Dr. Ward, you're in the community, you're sitting in a lot of different boards, task force, you're leading them. I mean, talk about an amazing nine months where you're in demand, right? Um, talk to me a little bit about how it's been to sit in those different sectors and scenarios and connect the dots. What are some interesting things that people are doing to move the trajectory? You know, I, I, I want to speak a, a little bit about um, transformation for myself, right? Um, and then I, I want to speak about other people. I think one of the things that I've learned about myself is I'm going to ask for what I need. <laughs> and, um, you know, these last nine months have really been, Belanda, you don't know when you're going to get this next opportunity. So ask for it. And I'm asking for it on behalf of community, right? I'm not asking for what I need. I'm, I'm, I'm putting the ask out there so that people understand this is really about life or death right now. And so... I think that's been a transformation for me too. I've also been um, privileged to sit in a space where people are consistently coming back for this conversation. And so people haven't abandoned it yet, right? We're, we're nine, 10 months into this era um, of, you know, um, how do we get to civil liberties for all? Um, and I'm, people are still in it, you know, people have not said, okay, we're done with this. This was fun. Moving on to the next thing. So I think I'm, I'm super proud of people sticking with it. I'm also super proud of people, you know, calling higher institutions of higher education to get some help and support, um, you know, as they're trying to evolve their practices in their organizations and agencies. So I think we need to 
we need to keep the force alive, right? We need to keep the pressure on um, and we need to ensure that this is not just a moment in time, a blip, a mistake, but that this is really gonna lead us to dismantling all of the systemic issues that create the disparities that we see, right? I wanna have a time where I don't have to look at data to see how my brown people are not doing, right? I, I wanna see, I want to see data that says, oh, wow, look at all this good stuff happening here. That's what I want. So we've got to keep the pressure on. This is not a one-time thing. This is not 10 months, nine months, 18 months, right? This is a lifetime's worth of work that we need to get in and make sure that people are, our brown people are really excelling. That's what we got to work towards. I really appreciate that. And you know, <clears throat> for me, in the midst of all this, I've talked to the both of you and a lot of um, our black and brown leaders across the state, and we came up with our racial equity uh, framework. And one of the biggest pillars of that framework, I think the foundation of it for me, is about creating spaces of joy for young people. That our young people are not broken, that our young people don't need all these other things that we think that they need, that they need a respite, they need a place of joy. That circumstance is what has driven some of their realities, but it's not because of a lack of brilliance or resilience or um, intelligence or ability. And so I'm gonna end this by asking you guys the most, you know, I think powerful question. Um, that I can ask because it's really what we have to do together. And it's how do we start to create spaces of joy for young people? How are you doing that when we think about, you know, um, this wind down, hopefully, of this global pandemic into a new reality? How do we create those spaces of joy? Because we all need it, but our young people deserve it. Dr. Ward, go for it. So the one thing that I'm doing is spending my money, <laughs> right? So I'm spending my money on young people to celebrate them. Um, so, you know, for our young people who are in college, who graduated from our program, for our young people going off to college, how do I make sure that they know that they're loved? Um, and how do, I, how do I invite other people into those celebrations? So I, I'm putting my, my money, you know, where my mouth is to make sure that they feel and know that this university is supporting them. Um, I'm also, you know, um, making sure that um, they know that they can always come back. So the one thing this pandemic has taught us is that sometimes people can't surge through like you or I might be able to surge through. And so we have to create um, an opportunity for young people to say, I need a break, I'm tapping out, but I'm gonna come back, Dr. Ward, <laughs> right? So um, that, that is another thing that I think is really important as the pandemic does wind down, that we re-invite young people to re-engage, you know, um, when they're ready. I, I would love to pick up there in terms of giving them permission and reminding them that it's okay to take a moment. I've been talking with a lot of student leaders who are feeling the weight of this work in addition to being students and just saying, you know, while we are asking for your thoughts and we value your contributions, we also see you as students. That's why we met you. That's how you, you know, landed on our campus. Um, the other piece is reminding them that they are not operating in deficit, pushing up against the narrative that the scholarship says that they are overwhelmingly. That was one of the biggest um, revelations that I had as a career change person, seeing the language that was used to describe students, right? Whatever bucket they fell into, whatever category they fell into, um, I struggled on a personal level with, you know, at-risk young people versus youth at promise or, or the fact that they are scholars, scholar athletes, right? Um, so, and then showing up right, beyond showing up for their programs that they 
want to host and facilitate around things that are important to them? You know, how am I supporting their development as leaders in this work? You know, if they have a question around a program or how to get funding for a program or what resources they need to get other students to the table who don't just look like them, because what happens is sometimes when BIPOC students are hosting programs, they are looking in the mirror with those who show up. So we're talking a lot about inter, uh, interdepartmental conversations. How do we get students from you know, all walks to attend who share different views and different opinions? So strategizing around some of that work, um, I think brings them joy at some level of joy and helps them get there. Um, and just listening, right? Um, I think this is something that we we refer to as invisible advising, where you know students may not get to their official advisor right away, but they know who to go to on campus, whether it's after hours, before hours, to kind of hear what they're experiencing. And so, you know, my hope is that that does bring them some level of joy and um, supports their success, not just survival, but watching them thrive for this. Um, entire college experience is, is what I'm hopeful for. I really appreciate that. I think the last thing I'll leave is this. I think none of us really understood what it was all the time to take care of ourselves in this process. I, said, I think this pandemic has taught us all to figure out maybe a hobby we have, how to unplug, how to unwind, hopefully. Um, but it's something we've had to learn. And I think with young people, it's making sure that they also are learning how to tap into their joy and their happiness um, and to be able to identify that so they could pull from that as life goes on and that they can find their own joy, not only in the spaces we create, but also in the spaces that they create for themselves. I really wanna thank you both Dr. Ward and Chitsani William West for being here with me. It's always a pleasure. We will continue with this work and this fight and I'm sure that we will have this conversation, hopefully another moment in time where we can talk about the celebration, right? How long and how far we've come from where we are today. And so I have faith that our program leaders that are watching, people who are part of the mentoring movement, who are stewarding and caring for our young people are committed to this work and they'll continue to do amazing things so we can continue to lift that. So I wanna thank you both and thank everyone for joining us today. Enjoy the rest of your afternoon.